musicians and looking forward to having the choir back in the choir loft in August. Uh, they're only taking a brief break, so they will be back soon. Uh, but I'm loving this special music as we wait. Don't you just love Christmas? I love Christmas. I was asking earlier at the, the kiddos in the 9 o'clock service, I asked them what they like. Guess what they said? The presents. <laughs> and of course, the greatest present of Christmas is the gift of our Savior. We could ask for no better, uh, there's no present better than that. Of course, I do love the Christmas music. If it were up to me, we'd sing Christmas hymns all year. Uh, I love them. Normally in the Advent season, you wait and sing the Christmas hymns after uh, Jesus' birth, but, I, you know, I just can't help it. We just have to sing those Christmas hymns right all the way through Advent. Even in the season of preparation, let's sing those hymns. But I also love there's some contemporary worship songs that I love. I, you probably have heard that Amy Grant's Grown Up Christmas List. Have you heard that song? There's some, I want to share just a chorus of this. So here's my lifelong wish, my grown up Christmas list, not for myself, but for a world in need. No more lives torn apart. Wars would never start. Time would heal all hearts. Everyone would have a friend. Right would always win. Love would never end. This is my grown-up Christmas list. Beautiful, beautiful wish, isn't it? I think we all have that same Christmas list. It reflects the hope we feel as we celebrate the Savior's birth. It speaks of what is possible when we love God and when we love others as we are called to do. But in our everyday lives, we sometimes lose sight of this profound hope and joy. I don't know what it is, but it kind of clouds the view for a minute. The pressures and challenges of daily routines overshadow the simple yet essential truth that Jesus' birth brings joy to the world. This joy is not limited to the Christmas season, but is available to us every day of the year. Rediscovering joy involves returning to the true source of joy, Jesus Christ. It means allowing the, the good news of his birth, of his life, of his death, of his resurrection to permeate our hearts and minds, transforming our outlook on life, allowing our spirits to be lifted, no matter our circumstance. Today we're going to read from Ephesians. This is a letter Paul wrote to the church reminding us that we are one in the Spirit. But before I read the word of the Lord from Ephesians 2, 11 through 14, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of our mouths, the meditations of our heart, are acceptable to you, our rock and redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your word spoken into our lives today. And all God's people said, Amen. Hear now the word of God from Ephesians 2, and I'll be reading verses 11 through 14. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, this may not seem like your typical Christmas message until we take a closer look. Paul is talking about the truth that we were people without hope until Christ came. We were Gentiles. We were the uncircumcised, the outsiders, the aliens. It says strangers to the covenants of promise. We were not the chosen ones. And then in verse 13 it says, But now, but now, whenever you hear that phrase, so then, but now, even so, you know, you know to sit up and take notice, something good's coming. Say it with me, but now, but now, but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen? We have been brought near, first by the birth of Christ, then by the life of Christ, then by the death and resurrection of Christ. We are brought near by the blood of Christ. Christ is our peace. In Christ, we are made one in the Spirit. There's no longer us and them. There is one in the Spirit of God. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. You know that song? We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. The song goes on to say we will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. Friends, this is a good word. Together, let us spread the word that God is in our land. This past week, I was just stunned as I saw the the video of the fire at Zebulon. I was four hours away at St. Simon's Island enjoying some great teaching at Georgia Pastor School. Friends were sending me text messages and videos, pictures of the fire. Ariana, the pastor there, normally goes to Georgia Pastor School, but she'd been on vacation last week and And she just felt like she needed to stay home. Was God not in that choice? She and I were roommates on our trip to Israel, a local pastor's trip. They have a trip for the ordinands, and so they offered a trip for local pastors to go to Israel at a reduced cost. And we got to see all the places that we see and read about in Scripture. And she and I were roommates. And we've been friends ever since, so I I felt the loss on behalf of my friend. I offered to help her any way we could, but to hear her talk at the prayer vigil on Friday, there were calls for uh, offers of help from so many people. And I saw just how strong our United Methodist connection is. Our disaster response team brought out their portable power unit, and that's how they were able to have church on the grounds today. They brought power so that they could have a keyboard. Their beautiful piano was destroyed. She was talking about some of the images from those moments after the fire. And you may have seen it in some of the pictures on Facebook. There's a, when you're looking to, you know, at the damage, there's a gold cross that still hangs. And that was at the back of the choir loft. 
And do you know that as the firefighters sprayed water on the building, that cross just gleamed? There is hope, even in disaster. She said one of the firefighters was able to bring out a, a really thick mahogany box that housed their pyramids. And the only pyramids that were destroyed were their green pyramids that happened to be on the pulpit at the time. But all the other pyramids that they had had since the beginning of that church, almost 200 years, I don't know if the pyramids were that old, but the, you know, some really precious keepsakes of the church were saved. And then when we were there Friday, she showed me this large beam. And it was, you know, from that original church. And she said that it was in good enough shape that they were going to have woodworkers take that beam and fashion a cross that will stand in the sanctuary when they rebuild. Pieces of the past have been saved. The building is gone. But the memories remain. Even in these difficult days, there is hope. They're already thinking about what God might have in store for this new building they're thinking of. And that's what Paul is reminding us of in this letter to the church in Ephesus, to the church today. So church, what gives us hope? What gives you hope? What makes you hopeful no matter what may come? Paul is reminding us that our hope is in Christ. Amen? Our hope is in Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Even if this beautiful building should burn down, and I pray it does not do so again, our hope is in Christ. It's not in a building. It's in Christ. Hear how he describes our hope, and I'm flipping back to the beginning of this chapter in chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. He says, but God, there it is, but God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What a precious promise, right? What a precious promise. Then jumping ahead to verse 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. It gives us hope. We're saved by grace through faith. And while we are encouraged to do works in the name of Christ, those works are not what save us. Those works bring glory to God's name. They are evidence of the faith that changes our hearts and our lives. Neil sent me pictures of a ramp that he and Charles and Tracy helped put in for one of our members, Bill. And he used that ramp. And he has hope again because of the good works of those who love the Lord. The works don't save us. They're evidence of what we believe, of who we are, of the hope we have in Christ. In the passage I read at the beginning of this message, Paul reminds us that we were once hopeless. We were once hopeless. But now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
So this is actually a great Christmas message. Because of the birth of our Savior, of his life, of his death, of his resurrection, we have hope. But now we have hope in Jesus Christ. Picking up at verse 19, it says, We are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are citizens with the saints and also the members of the household of God. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom we also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Can you picture it? But now we have hope. In Christ. We are God's dwelling place. He lives in and through us, and because of this faith that we have in Christ, we share that gift with the world through beautiful acts of love and mercy and grace. Acts demonstrated by the diapers that line our altar rail this morning. We see a need in our community. And we help to meet that need. Meeting the need is not what saves us. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. We are one in the Spirit. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is our foundation. And even if our building were to burn to the ground, our hope would remain. Because our hope is in Christ. May it be so in our lives today. Amen.